Russia has stabbed us in the back. And each day that Snowden is allowed to roam free is another twist to the knife. Tough talk from Senator Chuck Schumer after Russia granted asylum to fugitive Edward Snowden this week. One of many challenges facing our next guest, General Martin Dempsey, President Obama's top military advisor, who's in the room for every national security decision the commander in chief makes. Our exclusive interview happening as he enters his second term and perhaps most intense period as Joint Chiefs Chairman, with violence flaring across the Mideast. But we started off with what the U.S. should do about Edward Snowden. Do you know where he is? No, I don't. How serious is this that Russia has done this? Well, you know, you've heard it characterized as disappointing. And, I, uh, you know, that, that is the, the first word that comes to mind. Snowden's not a guy that's doing these things for honorable or noble purpose. You know, he's not doing this to make some kind of statement or spur a debate. He has caused us some considerable damage to our uh, intelligence architecture. Our adversaries are changing the way that they communicate. My job is to protect the country. So I am uh, very concerned about this. Do you know how much classified material he has right now No, with I him? do not. I do not, although it's obviously significant. Is there a way for the Russians or the Chinese to get that information without physically grabbing his computer? Well, I don't know. I mean, that, that, that's one of those technical means that would exceed, you know, my, my knowledge. But uh, I'd certainly be concerned about that. Would that surprise you? No, it wouldn't surprise It me. wouldn't surprise you that they, they might have already gotten that information? No, it wouldn't surprise me. Another challenge on Dempsey's radar, the growing crisis in Egypt where we saw firsthand recently the passion of protesters determined to get ousted President Mohamed Morsi back into office. We wanted to see democracy in Egypt. We went to the ballot and we wanted democracy, but we didn't see democracy. In a highly controversial statement this week, Secretary of State John Kerry described the overthrow of Morsi this way. To run the country, there's a civilian government in effect, they were restoring democracy. Agree with that statement? I've actually uh, been uh, asked what I feel it is at this point, and my answer has typically been, I don't know yet. This will only be apparent as we see what the transitional government intends to do. He was a democratically elected president. How, you, how can you call it restoring democracy? Well, that's why I didn't sign up for that characterization when, when you just asked me. I think, I think frankly, that, that we will know what it is soon, but it may not be apparent. So Kerry may have misspoken there. I, I, I don't know. I, you know. I'm not going to speak for the Secretary of State. He's, a, he's the leading diplomat of our nation. I, I want to move on to Syria. Mm -hmm. This week, we saw video of Bashar al-Assad just outside Damascus, a place that was previously held by the rebels, now retaken by Syrian government troops. Is he winning? This kind of conflict, a uh, internal civil war insurgency, always ebbs and flows. He appears to be gaining momentum. But I don't think it'll be sustainable. What happens next? Well, the what happens next is the source of continuing discussions about our strategy and whether we should become directly involved or become involved through support to the opposition, building partners in the region, humanitarian relief. You know, we're doing, we're doing quite a bit. The one thing we're not doing is becoming engaged directly. Let, let me talk about Iraq. Sure. I have seen you, been with you numerous times in Iraq and through the years. I think the first time we met was right after the initial invasion. How do you view Iraq today? I think July was the most violent month in five years, yeah, about a right. thousand civilians killed. Yeah. Is Iraq a success? When I look back at the sacrifices we made in Iraq, we, we did, in fact, provide them with, an, with an, an historic opportunity to be what they want to be. Now, I'm not suggesting they're where they, need, where they want to be or where we would like them to be, because, again, this regional, this kind of unleashing of what probably is centuries-old animosities um, is going to take a while for them to get through. How much of what you learned from Iraq are you applying to Syria? It has uh, branded in me the idea that the use of military power must be part of 
an overall strategic solution that includes international partners and a whole of government, and that simply the application of force rarely produces, in fact, maybe never produces the outcome we seek. Meanwhile, back home, a serious challenge within the military's own ranks. A disturbing increase in sexual assaults, an estimated 26,000 just last year. The debate, whether commanders should be involved in the decision to prosecute offenders. Senator Kirsten Gillibrand wants to take it out of the chain of command. Why should it not be so if about half of women do not want to go to their commanders to report this? Yeah. A victim doesn't have to go to the commander. There are at least nine other places where a victim can go. And by the way, we're doing other things other than trying to, to uh, w uh, help uh, the senators that are interested in legislative changes to the Uniform Code of Military Justice. There's things we can do ourselves. We can, as the Air Force has done, we can accept uh, a program for special victims councils. Th there's You're at least, looking at all, all sorts We're looking of at every possible way and open-minded to every single uh, option. Okay. We're wrapping up right now, you had a grandchild, the eighth grandchild I this did. week, right? I did. And your job was to do what? Well, my job was to babysit the newest grandson's uh, two-year-old twin brothers, which actually uh, was a, probably the most difficult thing I've done since I've been chairman. You were telling me that one of the things your grandsons and all your grandkids love is you singing the national anthem at Nationals yeah. Park. How did that come about? This is the truth story. I'd gone throughout a pitch. And right before the pitch, someone had pre uh, performed the national anthem. It wasn't very good. And I take the, <laughs> no, it wasn't. And I take the national anthem really seriously. That won't surprise you. And I said to one of the owners, I said, you couldn't do any better than that? And he kiddingly said, you think you can do better? And I said, yeah. And so he said, okay, we'll set a date. And we set the 4th of July. You chose that, right? I chose the 4th of July. And you'll also notice, lest you think I'm in, you know, a, a brave man, I brought four of the best singers I could find from the Army Chorus. And together we sang the National Anthem. It was really moving, actually. It was a beautiful performance. Mm. And I've seen many others of your performances of singing. Anything you want to sing right now? No. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. And I knew you were going to ask. <laughs> yes, you did. You were prepared for it. Yeah. And I can't sing either. So <laughs> thanks very much for joining us, Thank Chairman Debsey. Good to see you again.